At the end of February and the beginning of March, after unsuccessful attempts to take Chernihiv by storm, the Russian army changes its tactics. A characteristic of Russians is, when they cannot do something, they start to level it with the ground. The doctrine of Yerasimov, chief of their general staff, the Scorched Earth Society, just stupid shooting by wagons, echelons. On March 3rd, Chernihiv found itself under one of the most massive bombardments. On the outskirts of the city, the Russians destroyed an oil depot. And nearly in the very center of Chernihiv, on Chonovola Street, residential buildings were hit by airstrikes. What one? Almost simultaneously with this strike, the Russian aviation destroyed two schools in the Podusivka region with 500 kilogram bombs. The regional authorities reported 47 dead and dozens of wounded from a Russian airstrike. Human rights experts qualified this attack as yet another Russian war crime. Yaroslav, the commander of the unit of portable anti-aircraft missile systems, sees the consequences of the bombing at his post. I can't even tell you what it was like. I thought it was my fault because I didn't shoot down the plane. Yaroslav got a chance to shoot down a Russian plane the next day. March 4th. At 1 in the morning, he received a command that an air raid was being prepared. Our aviators were not in the air. In such a raid, there always were three or more planes approximately. In a day, there could be two or three or four such raids. Yaroslav's comrades saw the plane through the binoculars. They thought it would be easy for them, and they flew at very low altitudes a kilometer, two kilometers, and the portable surface-to-air missile launcher LGLA can reach 2.5 kilometers. Yaroslav took aim with the Soviet-made Igla M-pads and hit the target on the first try and on the first combat launch in his life. The Russian airplane was just flew behind the building, and I immediately aimed right outside of the building and waited for him to appear. As soon as he reappeared on the other side of the building, I launched, and the missile hit the target. This was an Su-35 aircraft. It fell on the territory, not under our control, somewhere in the fields. This was my first combat launch. I was lucky, it turned out, because Igla is less effective than other men pads. Igla is 33% effective. So, it is necessary that three people from the crew to shoot in intervals. On March 5th, Ukrainian soldiers shot down the Su-34 of the Russian ace pilot Alexander Krasnoyartsev. They were using all possible launchers to aim at his plane. A shot from Igla at Krasnoyartsev's plane was made by the mobilized manager of Uka Poshta, Serhii Chizhiko. A launch that hit the Russian Su-34 was made by the border guards using exactly this Soviet-made anti-aircraft gun. This was done by the unit under the command of Vladislav Krivolap. In the air, we can hit targets at an altitude of up to 1,800 meters. For ground targets, 2,500 meters. He flew by brazenly at an altitude of up to 1,000 meters. Why so low? Probably for the purpose of sheltering from more powerful anti-aircraft systems, and he simply didn't expect that we could be in this direction. We shelled him until the end. Fully two boxes of shells went into it. Krasnoyartsev's navigator, Major Krivalapov, died during landing. Krasnoyartsev himself, a veteran of the war in Syria, who was photographed with Putin and Assad, ejected and fell on a residential house in the Masani neighborhood. Trying to escape, he shot a local resident, Vitaly Sergienko, who tried to detain him. Krasnoyartsev was captured by the Ukrainian military. You were just lucky the civilians didn't tear you to pieces. On the 4th and 5th of March, there were already a lot of downed airplanes over Chernihiv. There were five to six planes somewhere during these days. Russian pilots, welcome to hell. Today, three Su-24 or Su-35s were shot down over Chernihiv. As the first planes were brought down on the 4th and 5th, 
The planes began to unmask themselves less and began to fly more at night when they are less visible. Plus, they began to descend at low altitudes. The turning point came when the first plane was shot down. Then the guys began to believe in the power of the weapons and in their own capabilities. And psychologically, it opened up in them this sort of a thrill of the hunt. And after that, they began to compete with each other to see who could hit more. In March, a batch of American Stinger M-Pads arrived in Chernihiv, a more effective weapon for combating enemy aircraft. We arrived, received weapons, we didn't know what to do, started to figure it out. How to do it? There is internet, there is YouTube. We watched on YouTube, click, click, and we learned. This is how Vladislav Mohulny talks about his first acquaintance with a stinger. I always wanted to become a pilot, but it turned out just as the guys here joke. You don't fly yourself and you don't let the others. Together with his comrade Mikhailo Kuprienko, codename Moloditsta, they would wait for hours with a 15 kilogram stinger on their shoulders and under constant fire at the post in the epicenter supermarket area in order to catch an enemy aircraft. At midnight on March 14th, Vladislav succeeded. Some kind of stormtroopers sue aircraft for sure, but I don't know which ones. They were just rounding a circle above us. I think he just dropped a bomb and was ascending. And I caught him at the moment when he was starting to gain altitude. So it turned out I was shooting blindly. At the sound, and a little ahead of it, Maloditsya, the one I was standing next to, shouts, F it, f it. I launched. It blinded. I launched the rocket. And that's just when Docent calls. You f***ed it. You f***ed it. Even made a mushroom cloud. The plane fell onto the uncontrolled territory. Then Moloditsya said, that's it. The next one is mine. And even when I came to rotate with him, he remained standing behind me. And he just says, if the plane comes, it will be me. For the next three days, he just lived at the post, just for a chance to f*** a Russian plane. No more Russian planes appeared in the epicenter area, and Moloditsta continued to lie in wait with the stinger on his shoulder, singing Ukrainian folk songs all the while. <laughs> this was during an air raid alert, and I was ready by then. And for about two hours, walked around the roof with a rocket launcher. Well, I walked in such a way that I could not be seen. And my partner stepped out and took a video of me walking and singing. This is not a song, it's a cry of the soul. When I sang under fire about mom, this is what my soul told me. When it was very nerve-wracking here, explosions and shots from everywhere, I cheered myself up with songs on my post. And my partner was so pleased, he was asking, how can I be like that? I could see that he liked it. And at this height, no one could hear me. Well, I cheered up my partner and all was fine with us. All in all, during active fighting in the Chernihiv region, Ukrainian air defenders shot down nine Russian planes, one drone and one helicopter. Typical shots of the vistas of besieged Chernihiv in March 2022. In this video, residents of the Masani district filmed the shelling of the Chernihiv heat and power plants and the Shestyanka neighborhood. 
Have you heard about the city of Chernihiv? Yes. He is not there. Well, no. Level to the ground. And who equalized? Russia? Yes, our troops have leveled. Russian artillery and aviation destroyed critical infrastructure. Until the middle of March, the city was without electricity, mobile communication and water. After getting close and blocking Chernihiv, the occupiers were shelling almost every neighborhood. Missiles were coming from the village of Tovstolis in the north, from Zhukotki in the west, from Shestovitsia in the southwest of Chernihiv, and from Ivanivka and Yahidne in the south. At first, the enemy's artillery was lining up. 12 to 18 units of two C-19 howitzers and was firing from there. There were at least four divisions from the 120th Artillery Brigade, at least two divisions of the Uragan Rocket Artillery from the 234th Rocket Brigade, plus artillery that was part of the battalion tactical groups. The Russian army had a many-fold advantage in the number of launchers and shells. The advantage was four to six to eight times. It depended on the period. In the conditions of the blockade of Chernihiv, Ukrainian artillery was forced to shoot from the territory of the city. I think everyone saw this legendary video, recorded at the foot of St. Catherine's Church. In one small area on which we maneuvered and tried to perform our tasks efficiently. The enemy, however, was on all sides. When the maneuver paths were already a bit cut off, and the artillery was engaging from the city, the Grad rockets were constantly working there. As this was the area of their firing positions, they moved in, maneuvered and fired, including from the St. Catherine's Church. You can say our artillery gunners balanced like ballerinas on their points. They would roll out, fire, and quickly leave. We were careful to save our missiles. We didn't just shoot anywhere and nowhere like the Russians do. Just in one month, the shells count in the thousands. For the most part, the Russians assessed the work of our gunners with obscenities. In hitting their targets accurately, the Ukrainian armed forces were helped by the civilians who passed the location of the occupiers. By the aerial reconnaissance, a border guard with the name Tourist was watching the enemy on the roof of one of their industrial enterprises in the Masani neighborhood. This place is the strategic height of this area. Here we had visibility of two to three kilometers ahead. You can see the approach of the enemy, their dispersion. On February 24th, tourists once again returned to the ranks of the border guards. He served there under contract and under mobilization during the anti-terrorist operation. He actually served as a sniper. But the only thing he shared about this aspect of his work has to do with the captured Russian ammunition. We have had a Russian Lend-Lease here. We're very happy with it. Good ammunition, very accurate. Thanks to it, we hit the target with precision. Somewhat more willingly, Tourist talks about his work as an observer, which, he adds, brought much more benefit than shooting a rifle. He recorded his observations of the enemy in his notebook, drew plans of the location of their troops and equipment, and calculated coordinates. According to our information, we destroyed a tank, two-year-old and one Kamaz truck during the reloading and we reduced their troops by 20 to 25. This is the central road, the approach to take. They hid their tank there. Thanks to the transmitted information, the tank of the 1st Brigade, codenamed Klim, worked out on it and, with the first shot, turned the Russian tank into a pile of scrap. Here is the drone footage of that hit. The Ukrainian tank demonstrated a jeweler's precision in the shot from a closed position. He hit a target that he didn't see from a distance of seven kilometers. Soldiers of the 1st Tank Division practiced such exercises before the invasion. The tourist's observation of the enemy from the roof could last for hours. The hardest part of the job was the cold and the shelling. I was always afraid that I would flinch when something depends on me. That is my biggest fear. These are concrete slabs, frozen ground. 
I had to lie down and constantly stand on my knees. At some point, we were found out, and immediately the rockets rained onto the roof. Somewhere at 8.21 is when the first strikes were hit. Then the neighbor's gardens down below were plowed by the 80 millimeter shells. One of the missile strikes on Chernihiv, the Iskander rockets that hit the Ukraine hotel, received coverage from the Russian propagandists. These are the effects. Former Hotel Ukraine in Chernihiv. Mercenaries who came from abroad to fight were located here. Our work can be compared with the work of a surgeon who removes a malignant tumor in the human body. The hotel was empty at the time of the attack, and no one had lived there since February 24th. However, if you think the story of the base of foreign mercenaries in the Ukraine hotel is merely a figment of the Russian propagandist imagination, you are wrong. This fiction migrated there from the Russian military. The documents were seized in March. Among them was a map. It outlines how the operation to storm Chernihiv took place. I was thinking, how interesting. Why did they hit the Hotel Ukraine after all? And they wrote on their social media that there was a stationing center for foreign mercenaries. And on the map, they had a flag there. One day earlier, on March 11th, Russian Air Force destroyed the Haharin Stadium. The answer to the question, what was so important that the invaders saw in the sports facility, was also found on the captured Russian map. We were very amused to learn that, as it turns out, we have had here a serious cell of the right sector. And there are flags and signatures stating that we have a lot of national battalions here. Do you know where the right sector headquarters were located? on the stand of the Gargarin Stadium. That is why one bomb flew in there, and then the second. Poor wretches. Whoever told them such nonsense? These people have an idea of what Chernihiv is, of the people who live here and of the situation. They were told something in their central military district, and off they went to attack. Russians received information about the situation in the city and the location of the units of the Ukrainian armed forces from the Russian sabotage groups operating directly in Chernihiv. We found a lot of documents of their SRGs, where they used fake passports and driver's licenses and saturated Chernihiv with their SRGs disguised as civilians. Our analysis showed there were up to 500 people in these ready-to-wear groups in Chernihiv. They walked about as civilians, and amateurs and collaborators poured reports into their program, noting what, where and how. I am referring to our positions, the location of the tanks, and that's why we suffered losses. One time, two planes were bombing one tank. Unfortunately, the crew was killed, and then they dropped eight 500-kilogram fab bombs on the tank. The village of Novoselivka in the first days after the Russians fled. This northeastern suburb of Chernihiv was virtually wiped off the face of the earth. Combat operations and shelling did not abate here from the beginning of the invasion until the last hours of the blockade of Chernihiv. On a 12-point scale, I say that Novo Salvika was the most hellish battle in the defense of Chernihiv. Those who were in the Novo Salivka battle saw their whole life flash before their eyes, and quite likely, they learned all the prayers. Novo Salivka was on the main line of attack of the Russian troops. The fiercest battles for the village took place here on the hill. When the guys moved on to that height, they crossed themselves as they went, because every day there were substantial and great losses there. There were as many as eight guys killed in one day. That's why they went to that height. Like, for their last time, their last day. The Ukrainian military called these positions Black Kite. Whoever controlled the hill controlled the approaches to Chernihiv from the northeastern direction. That is why it was simply being destroyed from the get-go, but the village and the positions were razed to the ground. As one of my soldiers quipped, Commander, there the bricks are to one side and the boards to the other. 
There, it was decided, despite the losses, to hold that height at any cost. Because if we did not, the losses could have been ten times greater later on. Here at the outer block posts, the Russian assaults were repelled by up to 40 soldiers. We only had small arms, RPGs, and that was it. In the trenches and dugouts in Novoselivka, fighters are still finding shell fragments. I saw it with my own eyes. A tank would ride out, half of its muzzle sticking out from behind the hill. He was shooting directly at the dugouts. Our heads were definitely buzzing. My brain simply gave out. I understood there were shooting, explosions and everything else. But in my ears was deafness and squeaking. I was told about the Novoselivka battle, that there was nobody there who did not suffer concussion. Yes, that is likely exactly how it is. 99.9 percent, .9 that's how it is. One of the typical days in Novoselivka began with the arrival of Russian sabotage groups. After repulsing the attack, the positions of Ukrainian fighters were hit from several tanks. The tanks shot out all their ammunition, went for reloading, and at that moment, the Russians began to fire from the mortar launchers, artillery, and multiple rocket launchers. The atmosphere was, the wounded are screaming in the landings. We can't pull them out. Our superior shouts, brothers, brothers, help! In order to somehow press and tempt down the enemy artillery, so that there would be some time interval to evacuate the wounded. This road here was such a shoot-through that it was impossible to pass. There were times when, after the intense artillery shelling, we had two to three wounded, one killed. Every day, yes. Well, did you say goodbye to your life there? Yes, every day, a couple of times. What should I do? Get used to it or what? I have nothing to lose. I love Chernihiv. Here at McDonald's is cool. We stayed positive, supported each other, laughed about it and said that they were poor shots. Such was the high density of the fire that after each attack they adjusted their artillery immediately nailed us to the ground so that we could not see what was going on. They were firing non-stop for 40 to 50 minutes. Every 20 to 40 seconds while the reloading was going on, we rested. And then it started again. One or two shots. And then there were times when they were hitting from two sides, from one side of the landing and from the field. In Novoselivka, you smoke cigarette after cigarette and you don't wish for anything, not to eat, only to have water. Stress comes continuously, constant stress. You're under stress and there is not a moment when you can relax. Ukrainian artillery could not give a symmetrical response to the Russians. The enemy had more barrels and ammunition by orders of magnitude. When our scouts were in the village of Ulyanivka, they directed a mortar launcher. Sometimes they called for artillery to work out on the Russians' positions. They reported that, yes, the ammunition set of the Katsap tank worked, meaning it was destroyed. We pinned down a group of their infantry that was walking around Ulyanvika at night. They were collecting the wounded and dead. We worked out well. I heard on the radio exchange that we had a 120 mm mortar somewhere there. He helped us there, but as I understand, there was a bit of a problem with ammunition at that time. So we answered sparingly. Our late platoon commander, he climbed a tree, hugged the trunk. Binoculars, radio station, I am near him at the trench. And just then the shells are coming, the tanks are coming. And this tank shell is landing quickly, out an immediate arrival. He sees a flash and continues to direct the fire for the Desna over the radio. To the right, forward, 500 meters correction to the right, 100 meters ahead, and the shells are falling all around. I tell him, Sir Yoga, shards! Oh, don't bother me, let me work. There are two BMP-1 fighting vehicles standing there. It was a reserve group, and in the event of something, they jumped out of these IFVs and shot from the canopy in the direction of Ulyanivka, Kiselivka. And when they started using aviation on us, my friends and I realized how strong we are, that they are starting to use aviation, 500 kilogram bombs on us. 
This photo shows the consequence of the landing of a 500 kilogram air dropped bomb on the Ukrainian positions. Where the bomb hit, there was a tree there, with a trunk so thick that you couldn't wrap your arms around it. Branches were all that remained of that tree. The pit is 15 by 15. And all this sand flies onto the guys' heads. It was fortunate there were two of them in that trench. One got out of the sand by himself. The other screamed from under the sand. I'm suffocating, I can't. So in the middle of the night, it was so cold. We were digging him out with our hands. First, we dug out his hand. Then he yells from under the sand. Dig up the head too. We dug up his head, face, then sat down, took a breather, laughed about it. We got lucky. If you count the shell craters from the bombs that flew there, there were 56 shell craters from aerial bombs alone on that mountain, not including artillery. In March, Russian special forces began to storm our positions in Novoselivka. They were definitely moving in with their usual one to five tactics. There were almost always five of them for each one of our troops. We took from them their well-known Tiger vehicles and light armored vehicles too. And in them, they had the flags of the main intelligence directorate of the Russian Federation. Intelligence units came. And mind you, those that fought in Chechnya, that had experience in Afghanistan, because when we captured them, we really got well-trained personnel. In the end, they always stayed behind us. Then, over some passes, they would be on the side. Then, they were somehow retreating. But how to say it correctly? Not all retreated. On March 9th, they decided to really take us out of here from this position. And to seize it. We survived, but they fired at us from every possible weapon. We retaliated, started shooting back. They realized they would not pass here. And therefore, began to use their artillery on our positions big time. On this day, March 9th, we had two guys killed. A week later, on March 16th, the Russians launch a new assault of the hill. First, three tanks rode out, their artillery engaged right before. Then they secured themselves, and three more tanks jumped up there. That is, they brought to position six tanks and four Tigers, and their reconnaissance pulled up. Then, the BMP was pulled up. Denis Kuzmenko remembers those events. Before the start of the assault, he slept after his watch. I woke up because sand fell on me. We got into position, literally just half an hour passes, and the real meat begins here. Bullets were flying. I thought we were breathing those bullets there. There was simply no free space in the air. RPGs are there, bullets are there, VOGs are there, AGS grenade launcher is there, everything is there. Tigers are sewing us with machine guns. Machine gunners are on both sides. The plane is coming. It was altogether a horrible picture. The Ukrainian military received a command to withdraw from its positions. But we would have managed had the order not arrived. We would have stood to the last. There was no other way. Denny's comrades died in that battle. Many guys lay down their heads here. Our regulars. You're a Bilik. And Zenya Tetyanenko, they died here on the left flank on the 16th. On the same day, a medic of the 1st Tank Brigade died in Novoselivka, Volodymyr Andrychenko, who in peacetime was the head of the regional branch of the Committee of Voters of Ukraine. Under the heavy fire from the Russians, he drove out in his small car to the front line to evacuate the wounded and dead. Vova is driving, still driving over there somewhere, and machine guns start firing at him. Then he drops off Shaman our chief of medicine. He is driving at high speeds here alone, and an RPG falls right in front of him. He falls out of the moving car. I catch him and hear his last breath, and that's it. He had a pneumothorax, a severe contusion, and that is what he died from. Ukrainian armored vehicles are providing cover fire for withdrawal from the positions. There is a command on the radio to launch a tank, for them to pull up here to rescue us, then armored groups, there were two of them, it seems. That was when codename Horabri sent two of his boxes to help us. 
They just began to approach us, and the order came that it was not necessary, because the Russians were no longer twitching. I personally think they were just afraid. There were 30 to 40 of us standing here, and they barely cleared the position here with all their strength. But what would have happened here? The Russians hit one of the BMPs of the 1st Tank Brigade, which was covering the retreat. Two of the three crew members died, Dmitro Tatarenko and Eduard Tiohun. The Ukrainian military set up new advanced positions just at the entrance to the city. Very symbolic to hold the defense along the line of the entrance to Chernihiv. The Russians entered the outskirts of Chernyev with sabotage groups. In our direction, at the end of March, they entered the suburbs of Chernyev and could not advance any further. We had an anti-tank unit in this area, and my infantry was located directly in the village itself. There is a system of observation points, an anti-tank reserve. This is, roughly speaking, where Novo Salivka turns into the Bobro Vistia district. So really, the battles were fought on these borders, in these directions. The enemy did not advance any further. The body of the deceased Volodymyr Andrichenko would be found in a ditch near a burnt-out car after the Russians fled. And on the hill would be found a grave of an unknown soldier and of Yuri Bilik, who died in battle on March 16th. We haven't found everyone on that hill yet, unfortunately. A couple of men are missing, and I hope that on this mound there will be a memorial erected to those guys. We lost many of our guys there. It's hard to accept every day when the guys die. Why? In order to understand this, you need to have your own children, send your children to war. My eldest son is also fighting. In this video, which was published by Russian propagandists, we see the moment of the shooting of a car of Ukrainian border guards near the landfill in Masani. There, Russian special forces set up an ambush for the defenders of Chernihiv. When the situation around the city stabilized, the enemy realized they could not take us from the east. They set up an ambush for the border guard patrol, fired at a car from an RPOA Schmel, Six people died immediately, and four were taken prisoner. The personnel of the Border Patrol Group, 11 people, moved to the position. One group of the enemy was located on the right side of the road, the second on the left. The first group missed the car, the second inflicted damage. They used small arms and Kalashnikov assault rifles. They also used missile launchers. We found three empty tubes from RPG-26. The car was hit and burned up almost immediately. It rolled over. The driver was killed first. The cartridges we found provided evidence that these were special forces due to the fact that there were no markings of any kind on the cartridges. These sleeves were without numbers at all. First of all, two special forces regiments that were around Chernyev, units of the reconnaissance battalion of the 41st Army, they are quite the opposite. They fought decently. The border guards who were stationed here and the mass, they suffered losses because it was the special forces who fought against them. That is, battles mostly took place at night. People who are ready with night vision devices to say that these are stupid troops, that is not so. Tourists observed the actions of the Russian special forces daily from his position in the Masani neighborhood. At the dachas near Chernyev, after we straightened out our defense line, our positions were occupied by Russian troops. These groups went into the forest. They used the terrain, something they were taught at the training grounds. They approached us as close as 200 meters. Through the forest, they tried to get into the industrial area, to gain a foothold but we didn't let them do it. During the execution of our tasks, we recorded 11 approaches of such combat intelligence groups. 
All their attacks and attempts to enter the city were repelled. The enemy suffered significant fire damage. And there is information from the local population, from the Starii, the Novi Bilas, where our section is, that during the retreat, they carried out the wounded and killed troops. The groups were 10 to 15 people, very well equipped, very well prepared, with evidence of their work as they approached. On the night of March 14th, the Russian sabotage and reconnaissance group made an attempt to take positions in this forest near the village of Novi Belus. At night, we noticed their group, their IFV. They disembarked and after 20 minutes the battle began. They were getting out from the road and advanced towards us. It turned out that there was not one group, but two groups. There were 12 of them in front and another eight were moving to our rear. We saw them only through the thermal imager. These were very well prepared groups. These were Russian special forces. They had pretty good equipment. Gun sights with night vision, and they shot very well. A Russian sniper killed border guard Bogdan Nazarenko and tried to aim at Maxim. With them, it was one bullet, one person, another bullet. They were aiming at the thermal imager. I was looking through the imager, then moved it to the side, and sure enough, if I held it near my face, I wouldn't be here. The bullet hits Maxim's thumb. The finger was pierced here and hung only on this piece of skin. There is no bone here. With my one hand, I could not wrap it. So I asked my comrade to wrap my thumb back. There was pain. But we all want to live. If I retreat, who will protect the guys? The fight lasted for up to 20 minutes. The border guards ran out of ammunition and began to retreat. The emotions, like in the Commandos movie. Explosions, shots, grenades, VOGs, everything was there. When we started to retreat, their third group began to work at us. They aimed mortars, tanks and self-propelled artillery at us. There is that forest. There is no living thing left in that part of the forest where we were. The Russians, having suffered losses, also left their positions in this forest. The next day, when we came back here, there were a lot of drag marks. According to our calculations, seven to eight people. The comrades of the fallen Bogdan Nazarenko will not tell his wife about the death of her husband until the last moment. His wife was pregnant, and when he was killed, there were two weeks remaining until the due date. We didn't tell her until the last moment, so that everything would be fine. He had two newborn boys. These videos were shot in Chernihiv on March 22nd. The battlefield was a ski base where Ukrainian biathletes trained and prepared for competitions before the Russian invasion. Artillery, mortars and aeroplanes bombarded the base for the entire month since hostilities began, destroying it almost completely. Here everything was covered with fallen trees. There were no leaves yet. So the forest was buzz cut to number three, as one guy joked. This was not the first time the Russian army tried to enter and gain a foothold here. On March 16th, at the same time as the storming of positions in Novoselivka, up to a dozen Russian troops entered here. Ole's unit lost two soldiers in this battle. He was standing here, and the SRG came in, as I assume from these positions. And he was killed. A bullet straight to the heart, I think, because he didn't have time to peep. And our sergeant was cooking dinner. And he was also shot dead. Ole and his comrades entered the battle and forced the Russians to retreat. We hit him with grenades. They definitely had wounded because they retreated and taking him away. They threw his bulletproof vest and the helmets and the gun sight there under the fence. There is blood on the body armor. 
The Russians come back on March 22nd, this time with much larger forces. Using Tiger fighting vehicles and BMP, they attacked from the side of the occupied Tovstolis. They can no longer advance through Kiselivka and Novoselivka because one of our brigades is there, a mechanized battalion equipped there, a very serious strong point. The tanks were already stationed there and the street there is very narrow and inconvenient to advance. And on the right, Desna River in the swampy area. That is why they advanced with this goal in mind. Because to build along intestine from Kiselivka, Novoselivka to Cherniev, it would have been destroyed, definitely in the village residential sector. They needed additional paths of advance. The ski base was needed by the Russians in order to gain a foothold in the city and continue the movement deep into Chernihiv. If they captured it, the next target most likely would be the Chernihiv radio equipment plant, located three kilometers from here. Chezara as we understand, it's a monolithic building with a bomb shelter, many underground passages and bomb shelters. I understood that if we let them move into Chizara, it would be very difficult to strike them out of there. At 10 o'clock on March 22nd, our fighters on the positions at the ski base received information about the enemy's advance. And this infantry fighting vehicle rode out towards us on this paved path. After a shot from the anti-tank grenade launcher, it rolled back. In its place, the infantry began to run through the forest like hares, not at full height, but crouching, so only their backs could be seen. We fought with them for four to five hours. I can't say for sure. At first, they ran around. Then, we could no longer see them, and only heard single shots from there. The defenders of the ski base were running out of ammunition. Some of them decided to retreat, while the Russians were pulling up reserves at that time. We, a group of seven people, went alongside this fence to the garages. The person walking in the front looks around the corner of this garage and says, four tigers are standing. I take a peek and he just starts to spray from a machine gun into this corner. And it was spring then, and there was no vegetation yet. Everything was dry. And while they were throwing grenades and explosives, the grass caught fire, and everything was in smoke. And we decided to retreat through the smoke to some farm buildings. The rest of the fighters continued to fight in the encirclement, preparing for the worst. One of them pulls out the safety from a grenade and says, I will not surrender. Petya, are you with me? The other replies, yes. But in some miraculous way, they managed to retreat into the basement. Ukrainian soldiers were hiding in this basement. Reserves were drawn up to the ski base. The Russians retreated after the first shots. The support from our mechanized battalion arrived. A platoon of grenade launchers. And they repulsed the attack. They shot a couple of times with an RPG. And this Russian armor suddenly turned around. And its caterpillar track just flew off. They abandoned the damaged combat vehicle and left. And the Tigers also left. If we look at the ski base where the battle took place, our scouts did good here already. Thanks to the scouts and thanks to our 134th Guard Battalion. It was thanks to them that the elite unit of the reconnaissance battalion of Russia's 41st Army fought such a worthy battle. It was thanks to them that the enemy was kicked out of there. The Russians just ran away from there, valiantly. Alas, there was no drum to give them. Simultaneously with the assault on the ski base, the Russian army tried to advance to the positions of Ukrainian fighters near the Yatsvo Municipal Cemetery. At this moment, the closest trenches of the Russians were not far away, in the forest on the opposite side of the cemetery. Russians were there. And then they came out of their landings towards us on the 22nd. Maxim recalls that day was not particularly different from the rest in terms of positions. Russian artillery shelling came as if on schedule. We already knew the timetable. They start at 4 in the morning and finish at 11. That's when they have lunch. 15 minutes later, they begin to emerge from their landings and they came out in staggered order. They were shooting from the cemetery and we could hear them scrambling behind the fence of the cemetery. 
Ukrainians engage in combat near this road. The three of us lay low to the ground. One of us was immediately taken down by a sniper. The Russians were coming under the cover of their snipers. So one of us was shot down by a sniper. There were just two of us left. Maxim and his comrades shot back at 10 attacking Russians, killing four of them. What was most interesting is that there was no fear for some reason. The hands did not shake, just a cold calculation. Out of four clips, I had just three bullets left in the last one. They moved back to the landing, and once again the mortars began to fire at us. And the rest, I don't remember well. A mine fell nearby and a fragment flew into my cheek. The day after the failed assault on the ski base on March 23rd, Russian aviation destroys the road bridge over the Desna River. Six aerial bombs are dropped there. One of them hits the span and the bridge collapses. Chernihiv was connected to the big land through this road bridge. With the destruction of the bridge, the Russians testify to their own inability to capture Chernihiv. They cannot take Chernihiv from the 21st of February. Here is the recording of the intercepted communication of the Russian invader, made public on March 17. When they blew up the road bridge over the Desna, I have already clearly realized they would not go on an assault. We would be in a ring. I told the soldiers about Sarajevo during the Yugoslav War. And I prepared myself for the fact that we will probably be surrounded for a month, two months or a year. Personally, inside I was preparing for everything, all the way to the partisan warfare. I had no intention of leaving Cherniev. I'm from Snovsk. My parents and family are here. So where would I go? Well, there was no way I could be taken prisoner, because there is a criminal case against me in Russia. And at that time, they had a warrant for my arrest. I understood that I would get at least 20 years. The Russians pronounced it, with great pomp, the operational encirclement. But the operational encirclement was never really completed and the realization it would not be possible to carry it out dawned on Russians sometime on March 20th. And on March 23rd, the bridge was blown up by an air raid. After the car bridge, the Russians began to target the pedestrian bridge, the only one through which it is now possible to deliver at least some goods to Chernihiv. Look at these videos of the destruction. Russian shells destroy not only the bridge, but also everything around it. On March 25th, traffic on the pedestrian bridge was closed due to its emergency condition after shelling. According to the city authorities, about 120,000 residents remained in Chernihiv from the 290,000 who lived there before the invasion. The city is on the verge of a humanitarian disaster. In the most critical days of the blockade of Chernihiv, the only way to the territories under the control of the Ukrainian government lay along such field roads on the right bank of the Desna. People were evacuated from the city along the road of life, while in the opposite direction, humanitarian aid, fuel and weapons were delivered to the city by buses and cars. You understand that the loss of the bridge is not the loss of communications. Communication lines become thinner, less effective. But I think that Chernihiv could have easily made it through another month of heavy and intense battles. These small arms, Nalawas, Stingers, Javelins, they were delivered to the city in sufficient numbers. Even when there was no bridge. The road of life was constantly shelled by Russian troops. These images were taken on March 26th, when a convoy of civilians, Ukrainian and foreign journalists, came under fire near Chernihiv. Russian troops planned to complete the encirclement of the city. They planned to do this by crossing the Desna in the Kiselivka area. The troops from this direction were to unite with the units that were in Lukashivka and cut the road of life. The unit that entered Lukashivka. Later on, we counted about 70 units of armored vehicles, and among these were tanks, armored personnel carriers, and Taswane Son Sepyok. The main idea is to surely to surround Chernyev, cut the road of life, and take it into a ring. 
In order to increase mutual trust and create the necessary conditions for further negotiations and to achieve the ultimate goal, approval and signing of the above-mentioned agreement, a decision was made to drastically reduce military activity on the Kyiv and Chernyev directions. This statement was made by the Deputy Minister of Defense of the aggressor country following the results of the Russian-Ukrainian negotiations in Istanbul on March 29th. On the same day, Russian troops began withdrawing from Kyiv, Chernihiv and Sumy regions. On April 6th, the press secretary of the Russian dictator Dmitry Peskov called this maneuver a gesture of goodwill. At that time, this phrase had not yet become a meme. To understand this, let's recall the events that preceded the departure of the Russians. On March 24th, the British Ministry of Defense issued a report in which it states that the armed forces may surround the Russian group near Irpen and Bucha in the Brovary direction after a series of defeats. Just look at these shots taken by the Ukrainian military. The Russian army was no longer able to advance. The strategic situation during their offensive was such that they suffered heavy losses in the direction of Bucha Irpin and suffered losses of about 60% in the direction of Brovary. A few thousand units of equipment also came there, so four to five thousand units, and going back were no more than 1,500. So, just as at the beginning of the invasion, Chernihiv saved Kyiv from encirclement. So, a month later, the situation around the capital helps Chernihiv to withstand. In addition, the Ukrainian military was planning an operation to unblock the city. To do this, they destroyed all of the Russian logistics. Under our constant strikes were Shestovitsia, where the main crossing over Desna was, Yahidne, here were located the control points of the 55th and 74th brigades, and Vishnevi, here was the advanced control point of the center troop group. This video shows the results of one such Ukrainian attack, destroyed armored vehicles, and yet another one of its kind of the Russian military industry, the anti-aircraft missile gun complex, Panchir S. They moved through the Sheslovitska river crossing, and all the ammunition, fuel, everything that was going, food, we were destroying it. Damage was inflicted, everything was destroyed to the maximum, and it got to the point that they could no longer deliver fuel to Lukashivka, and they were removing one vehicle at a time. And these point strikes, which our units inflicted, kept them in good form. During the night, our troops would come out, do damage, and burn one or even two armors. We were destroying their logistics routes. They were left without fuel, ammunition, and food. Well, you'll not fight for too long if you are left without food and ammunition. In the rear of the enemy, a resistance movement was operating. Alexander Vasilenko, a veteran of the war in the east of Ukraine, headed one of these groups. These images were taken at the beginning of March, near the old railway branch near Soznitsya. Ukrainian partisans burned seven Russian gas stations with Molotov cocktails. There is an embankment there, and the Molotov cocktails were thrown from that embankment. Our guys threw them onto the first and the last one directly from the embankment. Then the guys ran away and came back the next day. There was no one there, and they completely burned the whole convoy. Weapons and explosives for the preparation of the sabotage operations were delivered even to the very deep rear of the Russians. Alexander accompanied one such cargo from Kyiv to Semynivka. Mines were brought, grenades were brought, so that the guys could set up landmines. To Semenyevka and back is two days of coming from Mena. Hunters and smugglers were engaged for this work. These were the people who agreed to do it during the war, those whom everyone harassed in time of peace. Smugglers, poachers, hunters. These are the people who know every path, every bush. On March 30th, an ammunition depot, which the Russians had set up in a local church, blows up in Lukashivka. The group in this village, which blocked Chernihi from the south, was left without most of its ammunition. Locals told us that on the warm Alexa day, they prayed to God that something would strike the ammunition depot. And something really did. Later on, we counted about 12 armored vehicles there. There were a lot of shells there, and the church was ruined, of course. On March 30th, Ukrainian armed forces engaged in 
combat and liberated the village of Sloboda. They were planning to encircle two Russian battalions in Lukashivka. It would have been the Lukashivka cauldron. I think they also understood this, because when the 58th had already entered Sloboda, we practically had to block just one road to Ivanovka, and through Kolishivka, two platoons wanted to inflict damage and simply block this road. That would have created such a small pocket. Emotions were bad, because the commander and I planned one pocket, and we practically closed two battalion tactical groups in that pocket. We have already almost finished the crossing, and then, when we cut the umbilical cord, destroyed the crossing. We practically encircled the two battalion tactical groups. We miscalculated a bit because they managed to get out that night. They just ran away. So we cursed a bit in our anger that we did not fully succeed. Even while fleeing, the Russian army continued shelling Chernihiv and its suburbs. Especially terrible were the last three days, when the Moscows had already decided they would retreat and decided to shoot out their ammunition sets. Everything was thundering here then. On March 30th, the center of the city, the market and the Korolenko library came under fire. On the same day, on the road of life, evacuation buses came under mortar fire. Three volunteers died. Russian troops fled from the Chernihiv region very quickly. In military terms, that's when everything you have, everything lying around is just thrown into the vehicles. And within 15 minutes, you are on the road. So, it was not a planned departure, which takes a few weeks. The departure from the Chernihiv direction was lightning speed. So, in one day, the whole group was already near Horodnia. The Shestovitska crossing was used to retreat from Lukashivka. They fled two to three vehicles at a time so that we would not destroy them. But in fact, 70% of the equipment remained at the crossing. We destroyed them, almost all of them. Units escaped there, maybe a few armors and maybe a few tanks. All other equipment was destroyed and there it stayed. If we look at Yahidne, a lot of the Russians' equipment was destroyed in the forest. A lot of it was found later, and we saw they took off their uniforms and changed into civilian clothes. They fled in panic. The most invincible army of the world fled. Of course, it's invincible, because you can't catch them fleeing. Fleeing, the Russian army left trophies to Ukraine's armed forces. This abandoned, self-propelled gun was found in Ivanivka, and this howitzer was left behind near Yahidne. In general, we took good trophies. Trophies starting with weapons and ending with the Tor missile system. We took hurricanes, tanks, IFVs, APC-82, practically the entire line of weapons of the Russian army. We have almost all samples at the moment, including the one with the 2022 year of release. Armored Kamaz trucks were taken, new equipment, everything was taken. On April 3rd, the Russian army completed its escape from Chernihiv Oblast. Toilet? No, this is not a toilet. This is how they lived. I couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. Because we were ready for the worst. Invasion. And everyone having to go out and defend their native city. During the hostilities, the Russian military group on the Chernihiv direction would lose up to 40% of people and equipment that entered on February 24th. This was about one and a half thousand units of equipment, and from three to four thousand soldiers and officers, and dozens of bodies of murdered residents and soldiers would be found on the territories liberated from the Russians. There was a will. In war, it all depends on the will, first and foremost, and not on stockpiles. Everyone wanted very much to hold the city, and no one wanted to retreat. We had Volodya here. He was just a month away after a heart attack. He was here. Really, if the Katsaps knew who was repelling them here, they would be ashamed. Although, what shame could they have? 
Even at the beginning of March, I was already sure they would never take Chernihiv. So well was the defense of Chernihiv organized. It is one thing to be on the outskirts, and quite another thing to enter the city, which is also full of territorial defense groups. And all the people, the whole city was ready to fight. All our soldiers who defended Chernihiv helped. Proper work of the artillery, proper support of the local population, proper organization of the work of the resistance movement. Chernihiv was united, and it withstood. People, ordinary people. We were there on May 1st, and when you walk into any yard, there are Molotov cocktails there. When Chernihiv was given the title of the Hero City, I didn't really like this name, because what is a city? Glass, concrete, asphalt, infrastructure, people are the main thing. Chernihiv is the city of heroes. Thousands of people rose up for defense, surrounded the city with barricades, tires, and concrete blocks, and the enemies realized it was not worth taking the city. The defense of Chernihiv against the Russians cost the city a destroyed infrastructure, almost 3,000 destroyed and damaged houses, and hundreds of dead. According to the city authorities, about 700 civilians and military personnel died during active hostilities in Chernihiv. They were buried here, in trenches at the old cemetery in Yaliv Shina. In order to understand the true price of the defense of Chernihiv, you should just come here, leave flowers and thank the soldiers who gave their most precious, in fact everything they had, so that Chernihiv would start to come back to life already in April, so that flowers would be planted and houses would be rebuilt so that people would go to the cafes and new Ukrainians would be born.